Alan Bresnik from Light Reading. I'm here with Koji Okamoto from Biavi, and we're going to be talking about what some of the latest things that are happening in the cable upstream. So, um, Koji, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Alan. Nice to see you. Uh, unfortunately, not seeing that show or anything, but it's good to see your face. Right. It's at least good to see, see us yeah. on video. Thanks. Uh, we're, Koji, we're hearing a lot about bandwidth demand, particularly in the upstream, taking off during the pandemic. Uh, what are you hearing from customers, from your operators, and how they're keeping up with upstream capacity demands from an architectural standpoint? Yeah, I think the uh, the big thing, uh, uh, as the operator already said before in the many uh, forums, is the uh, because of the people staying at home and even schools, you know, remote learning and so on, the capacity of the upstream especially is increasing quite a bit. And uh, mm -hmm. we've seen several methods that, you know, operators dealing with this challenge. Um, and uh, several options based upon your architecture you can pick different types. But the, in the summary, I was seeing people turning on OFDMA if your modem uh, is already 3.1 capable. So that's a good way to gain the uh, more capacity as well as, well as the uh, bits per hertz, which is more efficient. Some mm -hmm. operator even talking about increasing the frequency band in the U.S., for example, from 42 to even go to 204, not just to 85, but to 204. So that's kind of mid split. I've seen people adding more carriers in the, let's say, lower frequency part of the band because they just don't have the time to wait for those frequency changes or 3.1 modem to be all rolled out. So that's happening. Uh, and also even seeing more node splits, faster node splits, kind of traditional method. And in the end, more DAA rollout, you know, faster rollout happening at the same time. And some selected spots that the, uh, especially international market, I've seen also more FTTH rollout in a faster pace to accommodate these kind of uh, demand uh, uh, increase uh, in the upstream. Okay, thanks. What other technology adoptions or architectural evolutions are you seeing out there? Um, I would say the big one, especially on the fiber front in the access part of the network is, is big mm -hmm. uh, on top of the, you know, traditional 3.1 uh, or the, you know, coax uh, technology, I'll say. The biggest impact is mostly on the access related to DWDM network. Mm -hmm. um, I think, it, you know, now it's becoming more fundamental part of the DAA and the remote fi uh, architecture and in the critical piece of way they get more fiber it's the equivalent of having more fiber links to the uh, into the remote hardware it could be more 5 DAA as well as some people may look at that as for the future 5G extension so um, I'll say that's a, probably the, the biggest uh, impact and also seeing some more high fiber counts going into the nose and uh, also more uh, a rollout again we discussed in FTTH for uh, EPON and uh, uh, GPON uh, rollout uh, in this space. And then also transitioning from one gig to 10 gig is another big one. So uh, I can I see that from traditional EPON, GPON to XGS PON or 10 gig EPON. Um, but I see actually probably more XGS PON, even in the cable space, mostly because optics, I think, is a little bit cost effective because more customers rolling it out. And you, you, I'm sure you're hearing about the more uh, DOCSIS 4.0 discussions to increase the capacity there. Right, so lots of different options out there. Yeah, um, and this also translates to new need for processes and in the, in the tools to enable them to roll this out. So there's some implication for that. Okay, so service providers have had to show unprecedented agility as new operational restrictions have been placed upon them. What kind of dem uh, while demand for services has skyrocketed? Um, how have they adjusted their tools and processes to continue to build infrastructure and yeah. expand their access networks? Yeah. I'll say the uh, the biggest um, uh, impact is the focus on more um, in the changing the uh, process related to remote testing, you know, especially mm -hmm. in this kind of pandemic and challenges. Right. Uh, so if you don't have to send somebody to the home or so on, you know, I'm sure you're sensitive about that too, just like everybody else. Uh, and more disciplined way of deciding whether or not you dispatch somebody or not and what location uh, and so on is I think it's becoming more of a hot topic. Even once you dispatch to, to the home, like do we really need to enter the home or it could be outside? Um, so that's another like uh, important uh, aspect that customers looking at. And once they determine they really have to go into the home, um, then making sure you can really troubleshoot quickly and when you're visiting, make sure it gets done right the first time. That's becoming even more critical. You know, I, I used to have a, a friend, at, you know, um, even operator calling this kind of visit to the home invitation only visit. Right. So you just can't go there. And now it's even more of the case. 
uh, and more sensitive. So I'll say that's kind of the big uh, focus for the operators and, uh, and, and they need to adapt the process to be able to do that. Today's new higher bandwidth technologies require network densification, such as high fiber cables out to 5G cells or high density nodes and pond circuits. So what's the best way for MSOs to handle the increased test complexity to keep up with demand and network maintenance? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a, it's a real challenge. You know, I, I think the most important uh, thing is having as much automation with some type of visibility to the management team uh, in your process so that uh, you can really enable through the MSO and the contractor ecosystem a very consistent and repeatable process across very wide range of technicians and then a number of people too as well. And, and we really look, focus on the two different methods to do this. Um, one is to be called the centralized test system. And this could be applicable for customers who have a low penetration in the home space, so you got a lot of build going, or the customers who really want to have a more uh, a control in your, in your testing um, and, the, uh, and the test records and so on centrally. And the way it happens is that now you put all the test system in the head end or hub sites and you go out and the technician will carry the, basically the mobile type of device and be able to, to look at the shoot the OTDR remotely and all the test record is automated and have that the data records in, in the back. And uh, one of the good benefit of this, and you get the, uh, the ROI through the entire network life cycle. So build activation, maintenance and monitoring, so whole life cycle. So earlier you start with this more let's say the, uh, the return investment you get. The, another method still is more the traditional method, which is, hey, uh, technicians or contractors going out uh, in the field with the OTDR type of test tools to, to test these densification, the more fiber. Um, but the tough part is you got so many people doing this kind of job. So how do you kind of automate this? So important part of this method is the test automation through instruments and take advantage of the connectivity with a mobile device and have all the test data into the cloud with more analytics and the dashboard so the management team can really understand uh, where the problems are, the top problems are, and who is making the good uh, practices uh, um, making good uh, measurements and consistent uh, performance and so on. Um, and that type of step-by-step -step procedure to, to the technician really enable the repeatability and so on. So those are the two kind of, I'll say, the trend that's happening mm -hmm. uh, uh, around, the, around the industry to really tackle this uh, real, real challenge that we, we face today. Okay. Well, Koji, I really appreciate your time. And I just I hope we get to uh, meet again in person soon again. Yes. Yes, indeed. Hopefully see you, see you soon, Alan. All right, you take care. Yeah, bye-bye.